Hello and welcome to Health Watch. I'm Dr. Vince Yelman. On behalf of the physicians and staff at Ephrata Community Hospital, I'd like to welcome you to this segment. Today we're going to be talking about throwing injuries to the shoulder and elbow. And we'll be right back after this message. And welcome back to Health Watch. Today we're going to be talking about throwing injuries of the shoulder and elbow. And as our guest, we have Dr. Joy Long of Lancaster Orthopedic Group. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome back to the show. We've done other injuries, but specifically this uh, this injury. And I and I was uh, commenting before that you actually did fellowship training in, in sports medicine, but also in, in just shoulder injury. How'd you get kind of more interested in that? Than anything? Well, I, the shoulder is a, a complicated and complex joint, and I. Um, I really like working on the shoulder, and so the f fellowship I chose was specifically for sports and shoulder. So it was a lot of knees as well, but um, probably almost half shoulder. Really? That's interesting, because we kind of think of sports injuries with the lower extremities more, and, and uh, to see it concentrated in the shoulder injury, and that's what our, we're going to be talking about today. And we talk about throwing injuries. I guess we can talk about other types of sports as it affects the shoulder, but particularly shoulder injury and elbow injuries that occur in, in, um, in, th in throwing sports. I mean, we all do that on occasion, but um, the athlete who specifically trains and, and is, is versed in doing um, baseball particularly, although right. I guess it can be other sports, but particularly baseball. Right, so your, your classic overhead throwing athlete is your baseball pitcher, although every baseball player on the field does overhand throwing, and interestingly, a, a catcher and a first baseman throw almost as much as the pitcher. Yeah. Um, and uh, certainly you could talk about the quarterback in the football team, um, a javelin thrower, some of the other track um, 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 events, include overhand throwing, but your, your classic um, overhead throwing athlete is your baseball pitcher. And a lot of the studies and, and um, interest have been in that area, particularly because of Little League in this country, which is so popular. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, Little League starts at four or five years old, um, and we're all working to see our kids become another Jeter, uh, making $145 million for five years. But, um, but the whole idea of, um, of tr you know, starting our kids early, you know, you, and we've talked about this before, some of the growth issues that occur in young people that we don't quite appreciate. You know, that mm -hmm. shoulder isn't the same as a 25-year-old. Exactly. So one of the big things we have to remember in a kid is that the growth mm -hmm. plates are still open. And so the stresses that you're putting across uh, a joint are not just going across the the muscles and the tendons, but also the growth plates. And we've actually seen that in, in youth who throw to excess, the growth plates actually remodel or change um, slightly, and the, the bone structure is, is actually different um, at, at the adult stage in someone who threw a lot as a child as opposed to someone who didn't. And you can get things like stress fractures of the growth plate. Little leaguer shoulder is actually a, a stress injury of the, of the humeral growth plate. So it's definitely something we keep an eye on. And it's one of the reasons that um, we try to limit the number of throws for those athletes when they're that young. Yeah. How, and, and let's just talk about, I mean, what, would, what might your kid be complaining of at that point in time if, in fact, he is out there throwing? And what, so, what, what, what would you look for? Right. A lot of times it's an <coughs> aching pain to start with after throwing that gets better, you know, the next day, but it's worse when they're throwing. And a lot of parents think, well, your shoulder's supposed to hurt when you're pitching. And to a point that may be true, you know, putting some ice on it after a game if it's better within a day or so, maybe not a big deal. But if, if that pain is persistent through everyday activities, like lifting your book bag, or um, they have pains that, that's bothering them so that they can't sleep well at night, or they don't want to use that arm, those are indications that you probably need to get it checked. And um, if I like to say if something is lasting longer than two weeks, then, then that's something that probably should be checked out. Right. What can you, and in that checking out, you, you might see them in your office to examine them. What, what might right. you find at that point in time? So I would, um, if it is a throwing athlete, I would usually get a set of x-rays so that I can look at the growth plates. Sometimes you can see changes in the growth plates in these athletes, and if I see that, then I'm going to shut them down um, for a period of time until that growth plate heals. Um, if I don't see any problems with the growth plate itself, then the next step of my exam is usually the range of motion. And um, one of the things um, that I find is that there's actually a 
a decrease in the range of motion in the throwing arm, which is counterintuitive. You would think that you'd have more range of motion in the arm that you throw with. But a lot of times what happens is you have a, a small repetitive injury to that shoulder when you're throwing. You develop almost a, a, a scar tissue in the back of the shoulder and it limits your rotation. And it's the internal rotation or the downward motion that becomes limited. And we have a, a slide of that, a picture, and I can examine uh, the patient when they're laying on their back and as I rotate the arm down towards the table I can see that there's a difference between the two sides and if the overall range of motion is less on the throwing side than the um, non-throwing side then that's a, a real sign that that the shoulder is at risk and um, I usually start them in some physical therapy with some stretching exercises right away and I will not let them throw until until they equalize their range of motion. Yeah, of course the pressures we put on our kids, quite frankly, to you know be the star athlete and all, to getting these people back, then I'd be a little concerned if I was taking my son to or, or daughter to a, to a physician now and they were telling me there were actually changes occurring as far as other sports that they could play uh, and making that recommendation. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we go through. The long-term sequela, if that doesn't happen. I mean, I, I, you know, you're, you're seeing these kids doing these things and, they, and sometimes the pressures, and particularly on the, the athletes that are better at it. Um, um, are, you see, are these the ones that develop rotator cuff problems later on or, or you know, they get in their 40s and 50s now and you're, you're now operating on for shoulder uh, immobilities? A lot of people limit themselves before they develop a, a full rotator cuff tear, honestly. Um, there certainly are some athletes who go on to develop rotator cuff tears from this. More common actual tears would be a labral tear. The labrum is a cartilage in the shoulder um, that can kind of get pinched every, you know, as you're um, as you're rotating your shoulder. That's a more common uh, thing to tear that may actually end up needing surgery. The other thing that's more common to tear is if your shoulder is stiff, like I was describing, you end up putting a lot more stress on your elbow. So the force is now uh, passed along to your elbow as opposed to your shoulder because you're not rotating your shoulder appropriately when you're pitching. And this is what can cause these Tommy John injuries. Mm. So there's a <coughs> ligament on the um, um, elbow um, called the ulnar collateral ligament. And most pitchers, if you know, at the professional level, if you were to do an MRI, of that of their elbow would probably have a little bit of swelling or maybe even a small partial tear in that ligament just from the use but it can completely rupture when that happens um, uh, sometimes that can be one of the issues leading to what's called dead arm syndrome or you throw a pitch and it doesn't seem like you've done anything different but you get severe pain the ligament has ruptured and most people can't heal that without surgery if that ends up happening yeah I think the pitcher for Washington was an example of that uh, very right. prominent prospect uh, that they had and, uh, and literally that's exactly what happened to him. yeah and, and and it's it's tragic because it's a really I mean it's a it's a, it's a relatively big surgery for someone who's a thrower and it's it takes it honestly takes about a year to come back from. So yeah. it's not it's not just the kind of thing where you have the surgery and you're back a, a month or two later. It really is a long rehab. Yeah, especially at that level. We gotta take a break. We're gonna talk about some of the other injuries that can occur. We'll be right back after this message. And welcome back to Health Watch. We've been talking to Joy Long about um, uh, throwing injuries and, and, and particularly in, in star athletes and the like. And we know that they go through vigorous you know, uh, training exercises and the like. And, and again, you're trying to relate that to our kids and as they right. grow up and kind of giving them good good information and how important is it um, if you are in participating in sports like that that you uh, that to stretch that you work into what kind of what kind of exercises can they do to kind of preventive medicine I guess more than anything right so um, <clears throat> one of the main stretches that I recommend for throwers is the one called the sleeper stretch and we have a, a little slide of that um, the athlete lays on their side um, and then holds their arm and gently pushes it down towards the ground or the table or the bed, wherever they happen to be. And um, as they, as they um, apply this gentle pressure, they're stretching out the posterior part of the shoulder, which is what tends to get tight in these athletes. And I think that's one of the most important preventive um, uh, methods, uh, especially for the pitchers, is to do this stretch to, 
to keep them from getting that stiffness and the tightness in the shoulder, which then translate to in translates to increased force at the elbow. Certainly a good warm-up, you know, um, just some, some short tosses, progressing to long tosses, um, and um, what's called core stability, which we've talked about in the past, which is just that if you, if you think about the, the baseball pitcher's throwing motion, it's, it's, a, it's his entire body. I mean, from his legs to his pelvis to his torso, every part of his body is, is in motion at some point during the pitch. And so having a strong core and um, a, a good balanced lifting strengthening program is, is important, mm -hmm. especially as these athletes age. Now, you certainly don't want to push a 10-year-old in the weight room, you know, five times a week. But as, as you're talking about more of the high school and collegiate athletes, they really do need to be lifting and, and strengthening. It, it's kind of interesting there because, uh, you know, I played a little baseball when I was younger, but, it, the, you know, it, you don't traditionally think of a baseball player doing, uh, to build up his biceps and quads and all those kind of things, as, a, as but you're suggesting that, that potentially they should do some arm exercise as well. Certainly a, a good strengthening program. I mean, it's certainly not going to be to the same level as the football players. You know, but um, you know it's more of a, a toning and, like I said, a, a core strengthening program. Balance is obviously very important as you're throwing; you're ending up on one leg. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so those kinds of things are are very important. As is a period of rest. We recommend that that throwers get at least two months off a year, preferably three, from. Um, true throwing, and um, and that goes for the kids. Year round ba year round pitching is not necessarily a good thing um, because you're never you're never allowing those growth plates, those tendons, those ligaments to rest to recuperate. Even the professional athletes have an off season, and so I think um, more is not always better. Right. Just like little league has. Um, pitch count regulations, they keep track of how many pitches each each youngster has thrown and that um, the allowed number of pitches uh, varies with age so the youngest kids can throw up to about 75 pitches per game um, and then they have to have at least three days of rest in between before their next game. And that doesn't mean that that if, you know, Johnny pitched today and he pitched 75 pitches and dad was watching him and saw some things he did wrong, you're not going to take him out the next morning and have him throw a hundred times with dad either. You really need, need, to, to, yeah. need to take a break. That's a, that's a great point because I think we, we as parents tend to, to obligate our kids to do things that maybe not the rest of the best things for them. Right. Yeah, you know, I, you, you mentioned pitch count and I think, you know, uh, being a baseball fan and all that uh, and going back over the years, I could remember a couple things. Number one, there was no pitch count. The guys get went nine innings and pitched, uh, you know, whatever they were supposed to do. There weren't any relief pitchers, um, <clears throat> and you know, you kind of looked at the average lifespan of a pitcher in those days. And and you see now they're very much more protective. And I always thought it was well. It's a combination of they don't want them, you know, they get weaker after the 120 pitches, and it's not pitching as effective. But the suggestion is from you. There's another medical reason for why um, they're trying to yes. lengthen out these guys' career, and it's not just that they go yeah. 135 or 140 pitches a game. Right, and and you know there, there's a philosophy of a of an arm only has so many pitches. You know you try to 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 prolong that as long as you can. But the other thing is that um, you you don't want to push past fatigue because that's when you get injured. And honestly, that goes for any sport. I mean, no, um, if you're if you're if you're pushing past the point of fatigue, you're you're not working as efficiently, your, your muscles aren't working as efficiently, you're not as balanced, you're tired, and you're, you're much more prone to have an injury. And we've, um, we've seen that across the board. We see it with the soccer players and the ACL injuries. We see it with the baseball pitchers and the, all, the Tommy John surgeries. We see it with the skiers who, you know, fall, all have to get one last run in. Um, and it's always that last run that they fall on. Yeah, so interesting point. It's, you don't want to push yourself past fatigue in any sport, but particularly with throwing. In, in between innings, I, mean, I could, you know, we always see these guys go over and they're wrapping their arms. Um, I mean, is it the philosophy of keeping that muscles warm is, right. is beneficial? I mean, we don't do it for our kids. You see it in the pro levels all the time, but certainly um, that's one one 
theory is to, to keep your muscles warm, <coughs> and that does make sense during a game. Um, icing afterwards, ice, though, ice, is ice, definitely ice. the yeah. best way to go. You want to you, you yeah. want to keep a bag of ice in the in the dugout or in the locker room for for these kids, and 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 your pitchers should should ice down their shoulder and potentially even their elbow. And the value of that ice is it what it just keeps down it inflammation. It decreases inflammation and um, and swelling. Um, so there is a benefit to that. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Um, we talked about, you talked about this, the athlete. I have to, I have to laugh. A couple of things. You see, it used to see it in golfers. And histor historically, golfers were not the best athletes in the world. Um, they were, you know, they tend to be poorly, very good golfers, but they, they're no, no question about physiques or training or anything. Now you see so much more of that, um, the, the value of good golfers see in, right. in training and the like and their ability Strengthen to hit the ball. Yeah. Um, I also equate that to, to baseball players. Some of the pitchers that you'd see would be the portly um, largest guy could throw the ball, but you're basically he's throwing all with his upper arm strength yeah, and with less. Yeah. yeah, and we still see some pitchers that are in the pros like that. I mean, they're, they're highly trained athletes, but um, but your suggestion is that, the, again, they should work on all the things you would think of in working with an athlete that exactly. we should normally have. Exactly. You want to cross train. You want you want to have a healthy core. You know your 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 back muscles, your leg your th leg muscles, especially your th your thighs and the um, your what we call your stabilizers, so your abdominals and your back, because those are the things that help to um, keep you in the right position as you're going through that incredibly fast motion of throwing a pitch. You know, I mean, if you if you slow down looking at a pitch and, and watch the whole, like I was saying before, the whole body moves. You, the, you're stepping forward on your leg, you're twisting your torso, you're bringing your arm the whole way back and then releasing and, ha and there's a follow through. So it really is the whole body that's involved in that motion. Yeah, and you think about it now, they don't even, you don't, you don't get a look-see unless you're throwing the ball 90 miles an hour. Right. Um, and, you know, and you were talking about the different different types of pitches. We talked about curves and, and screwballs and the like, and your suggestion was that... Uh, it's very controversial. There's certainly some uh, medical professionals who feel that as long as you're throwing correctly it's safe to start relatively young. Officially I would say most recommendations would be not to do curveballs and sliders and those types of pitches until the growth plates are closed which is usually sometime in high school. Um, just because really the the thing where the the part of the child that we're really trying to protect is is their growth plate and Although the, the tendons and the ligaments are certainly uh, important, the growth plate is usually the weakest link in the young kids. Okay, go take a break. We'll talk more about this as we come back from our message. Welcome back to Health Watch. We've been talking about throwing injuries and its effect upon the shoulder and elbow. And Joy, we last left, we talked about <clears throat> the different types of pitches that people can throw. And I, and I know I've you know, been around sports all my life and watching some of the pitches I see, even at the pro level, they have a kind of an underarm motion. Uh, they seem to be around for every, uh, Kent to Colby, I always remember him pitching for Pittsburgh. I think he pitched a little bit for Philadelphia, but he had this underarm just would kill us because he could get, he could get as much action on the ball and throw it fast that way as opposed to overhand. Uh, and uh, these guys seem to be around forever. Um, and then I, I kind of look at the women's softball particularly, and women's softball as well, but it's that underarm motion. Is there, are there problems that can develop with that type of motion? Uh, and what's, is there similarities? There certainly are um, <coughs> problems that can develop with underhand throwing, although it's not nearly um, to the same extent as overhand throwing. It's definitely a lot different pressures on the shoulder and elbow. It actually is a little bit harder on the elbow and definitely a lot less stress on the shoulder to, to okay. throw um, yeah. underhand. Um, and so we, we do end up seeing, just like with um, some of the overhand throws, we see some tendonitis issues and um, inflammation and overuse type injuries, but the, the, um, the classic uh, dead arm is not as common uh, with underhand throwing. Right. And, and you know, to get into the uh, women's sport particularly, we always, you know, the difference between men and women, are, are, some are obvious, but the, the question about uh, throwing injuries and the like, um, are, there, are there issues particularly with young girls now? I don't know that a lot of them are playing playing hardball. I mean, it's a no, classic, but baseball, they do. baseball, I mean, Little League, certainly there are some girls on Little League teams. And um, Honestly, as far as the shoulder stresses, it's not a whole lot different if they're choosing to pitch overhand. It's, it's really the same 
um, as the boys as far as that goes, as far as pitch counts and stretches and the types of injuries. Um, but a lot of a lot of the softball um, injuries, obviously, it's a it's a different size ball, and um, the pitching is is underhand, and so th those those girls do sometimes come in with some tendonitis issues, but I tend not to see the more dramatic uh, as, as, injuries. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would think just that, and again, if you've ever thrown, it's a little more comforting to throw that way. Now at my age, that's the only way I can throw to the grandchildren. I got news for you. You, you talked about other um, other types of sports. I mean, we classically think about uh, baseball, and I and I love talking about baseball because that was the only sport I ever really could play. But um, uh, and you're seeing obviously less of that. Kids getting into different types of sports, you know, soccer and the like. And you and I've talked about that. And, um, <clears throat> but I and, and I was interested in hearing when you talked about uh, some of the track and field things. I hadn't really thought about that. But um, these kids that get into javelin throwing and javelin, all javelin shot put and shot put. Throw, yeah, these are all very similar to the overhand throwing motion. And so we can certainly see um, the same overuse injuries, the same syndromes in, in those athletes. Um, the football quarterback does tend to be a little bit different, partially because, you know, whereas a high school um, baseball player might throw 100 pitches a game, you're usually not throwing 100 times as, as the quarterback, unless there's a problem yeah, with the team. Yeah, really. We <laughs> can talk about that. But. Um, so usually the number of throws is a lot less for the quarterback, and, um, you know, the, certainly the, the, the throwing mechanics for, for throwing a football are very different than a baseball. You're not winding up. Uh, right. quite as in the same way uh, with a football. So although we certainly do often see what we call impingement or some bursitis, tendonitis type inflammation issues, and there certainly have been some quarterbacks and other throwing athletes who develop rotator cuff tears um, from chronic overuse, it's not quite as, as, as common. Yeah, but you, you know, I always think about the, and, and I think you brought up the point. It, it's not like they've been pitching for a year or two. These kids start when they're in, you know, playing midget football. You could be a football quarterback throwing from then till you know now in your 30s, and some of them in their 40s. But uh, that, that seems like a long time to be putting that type of stress because there's practices that are involved, and it's not yeah. like you're just playing a game day. They're well, they're throwing pretty much in camps and all the way through, and they've been doing it their whole lives. And they definitely need that <coughs> that two months or so of rest from throwing as well because they're definitely more likely to develop an overuse injury if they're doing exactly what you're saying. If they're doing camps and they're doing, you know. Um, training outside the of the of the season interestingly though football unlike baseball and soccer has not developed into as much of a year-round sport so even if you wanted to play football all year long there's yeah, not there's not the opportunity whereas you know there's indoor baseball all winter long where you know you can do camps and training and there's it, certainly indoor soccer all year long so those along with swimmers, gymnastics, um, those, those athletes tend to try to uh, compete or at least train in their sport for the entire year, which tends to create yeah. a lot more problems. You and I have talked about that, uh, that whole question of if you have a child, would you rather see him in multiple sports? You know, assuming he's not gonna be a star athlete someday, and we all think they are, but, but um, yeah, it, it a benefit to their body just yeah. being able to do multiple sports at different times. Especially like early on. I mean, yeah. I think w if if you're in high school and college and you're specializing in one sport, that's that's very different than when you're talking about a ten-year-old kid. You yeah, know? and yeah, we think of trying to think of. You talked about, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was a football player exactly, and I and I think there is one difference. I've not yet seen um, uh, anybody slam the pitcher to the ground on his shoulder, and yet I've seen yeah. a lot of of quarterbacks who, in fact, in that throwing motion, get thrown down and end up on their shoulder. And, you know, so, the long-term effects of that got to be dramatic. So certainly. And, and one of the things that tends to happen, a pretty common quarterback injury, is an acromioclavicular separation or shoulder separation, people call it, um, which is when the collarbone um, lifts up uh, slightly from the rest of the shoulder. Um, that's a, a painful injury, doesn't usually require surgery. Um, but yeah, that's one we see in the football players because it's a contact sport much more so than the baseball players. Although you, you can certainly see some contact injuries in baseball from sliding and um, 
Yeah, but then, yeah, it's particularly I, you see these quarterbacks trying to come back after an injury like that, and it's really a problem. In the last, just to really quick, we only have a couple of minutes, but uh, you know, kind of equating that to the other other kind of motion that you see repetitively as swimmers, and they absolutely do swim all year round, and and they actually have multiple long practices and with repetitive motion. Yeah, one of the big problems with swimmers is actually instability, where they have almost too much motion in their shoulder, and the shoulder becomes. What I, what I tend to call sloppy. It doesn't stay in its joint as, as, as it should. Um, so the muscles actually have to work a lot harder on a swimmer to keep the shoulder in position and, and help to um, do what you're trying to do. So they're tends, as they are overusing their shoulder, the muscles tend to get weak. The shoulder tends to not move as smoothly and they develop um, a lot of times what we call impingement or uh, which is a pinching of the rotator cuff and the bursa on the top of the shoulder, which can be um, quite painful and in, um, and inflammatory. The other issue is that the... Yeah, we have to break. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great way to end the uh, conference. And, and I appreciate you coming today, uh, Dr. That. Long. Yeah, that's good. No, thank you. And uh, thank you for watching online.